Hey everyone, it's Tim from Black Swamp here again, and you're listening to episode 24 of the Black Swamp Podcast. If it's your first time listening, thanks for tuning in, and feel free to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. If it's not your first time listening, we appreciate you sticking with us. We have a growing collection of episodes featuring conversations with BSP artists and educators, uh, as well as some other goodies thrown in here and there, so there's lots to explore if you're into that sort of thing. Uh, No super special housekeeping to make note of for this episode. Uh, We are coming up to the holiday season, so we hope everyone continues to take the necessary precautions to stay healthy as possible over the next few months. Uh, Our team is doing well, and business has been steadily getting better over the last few months. We truly appreciate the continued love and support from all our BSP fans and extended family members. And speaking of the BSP fam, be sure to search out and request to join the BSP fam group on Facebook and then subscribe to our newsletter if you haven't already. Uh, We'll throw a link to the newsletter in our show notes. Um, That's where we share regular product and artist content, including performance videos, education materials, and other fun stuff. So if you haven't heard the name MB Gordy, I'm sure you've heard him play before. Assuming you've watched a movie or TV show in the last 20 years or so, MB is an insanely active film and TV recording musician, having performed on hundreds of projects like Aquaman, Logan, Despicable Me, Hot Tub Time Machine, uh, TV projects like Game of Thrones and Battlestar Galactica, and plenty more. Uh, Seriously, yeah, it's worth an IMDb search just to scroll through all his credits. Um, MB and I talk about how he got started in the industry, how the pandemic has changed the recording process for him. Uh, We chat about Patrick Swayze, which is interesting, about how his sessions work, uh, his personal studio, and some other projects he's got going on. Uh, Basically, I needed a nap after this conversation, but it was worth it. So let's get started. Hey, MB, how are you? Hey, all right, man. Nice to see you. Yeah, nice to see you. Uh, It's going well. I'm not sure if we've ever... Have we ever spoken in person or virtually or just over the phone? We spoke on the phone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's cool. We're at least a couple times. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad. I'm I'm glad to see each other. Uh, each other face to face. They're super cool. Uh, yeah, I this know, is awesome, man. I think we've almost crossed paths, maybe at Nam a couple times, um, but yes. I don't think we've ever fully seen each other. So it's great to see and talk to you. And I, I absolutely, I pre- man. I appreciate you you taking the time to do this, and I'm I'm excited because I think this is the first time we'll get like sort of in studio like sound like percussion samples or like oh, okay. a- examples and stuff like that. So sure. I, okay. I'm totally I don't really have a script right now, so I'm just roll. I, whatever happens, happens. It's, it's okay, cool. great. That's that's the way we roll, man. It's jazz. It's <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so yeah, how how are you doing? I guess in this kind of COVID era, seems to be well, the yeah, it's, uh, well, as, you know, what, what, I think we're all in agreement. This is getting a little old and tiresome at this point, but, <laughs> yeah. um, uh, but, um, you know, what are we going to do? You know, you just have to make the best of the situation. Um, and of course, you know, everybody's uh, obviously in a different, um, everybody's in a completely different scenario from the next person, right. whether, I mean, you know, you're, from all, all walks and all aspects of music, certainly, you know, if you're a college professor, you know, you're, or on any, even high school, whatever, you're, you're having to work, everybody I know that does that has having to work way more than, than they did before, just because sure. of all the prep and the Zoom time. And then you get the, you know, Zoom burnout and all that. Yeah. And then, um, and then trying to teach online. I mean, you know, people have been doing that forever, but now you're forced to all day long. So it's a completely different kind of thing yeah um so um so there's that and then as far as the work that i do which is you know um stu- studio work um i have i'm fortunate enough, i can flip my ipad around and I'll show you my studio eventually here um but um you can see a lot of it behind me and i've just got like gear everywhere <laughs> but right um so for me i built this studio a while ago and um ba- back in 2006 as a matter of fact um is, or seven was when it was finished but um um so I've been doing this kind of, you know, home recording stuff or whatever for a while, but now it's, be, 
since it's everything's become remote, you know, I mean, it's starting to kick back up that people are doing sessions elsewhere. Okay. I've got one at at, uh, at Marco Beltrami studio tomorrow. I've I've done some at Fox. I've done some sessions. At, one at Sony. I've done a couple at East West. Uh, so they're 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 kind of kicking back in, right. but with all the COVID restrictions and you know all this other stuff, it doesn't make it ideal. So, so I think still some people are holding back on that so everything's remote um i i would say I'm, i might be a little busier maybe but maybe not i don't know it's hard to say because <laughs> because of the remote recording people are kind of taken to that more and more anyway so yeah, I mean, sure. you know look how many people you know that have studios you know so yeah. it's everywhere so um but you know we're making the you know i'm making the best of it and i guess the one thing is it, it's given me time to to do some writing and and get into other aspects of you know things that I want to do so yeah I mean I think that was one of my questions definitely like what um is there a silver lining or is there are you, is there some lemonade that you've been you've been able to make here like as far as like working on projects or devoting some time um to something that you haven't been able to before or some you know some other outlet of creativity that may have be maybe a result yeah. um been able to get a little more practicing in. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest with you, and I'm sure everybody's gone, gone up and down with this. I mean, man, some days, you know, you're just trying to start the day and get going, and you're just going, right. oh, man, I'm just I'm just not feeling today, man. I'm burnt. I'm burnt. I'm burnt from politics. I'm burnt from the whole thing. <laughs> and you're just trying to... So I, I, I will say this. I've been doing... I've gotten in more into meditation than ever before in my life. I mean, I've toyed with all yoga and meditation. I've done that sure. stuff on and off my entire life. Well, since I was 19, I would all say. Yeah. But um, but now I've been doing it a lot more. So <laughs> so like, and that so that's cool. That's good. Right. And I'm you know trying to you know keep my just head in a, in a in a much better space. So there's that and some home projects as well. But yeah. but in terms of music projects, um, it's interesting. I mean, because I you know, been in LA for so long, I know tons of different people. And a lot of people are, are, are doing their own little record projects now or their own, oh man, I've had these tunes I want to do. Could you, could you put some tracks down for me? I was like, of course. Yeah, let's yeah. go. You know, and I'm not, I don't have to be, I mean, it's always nice. Obviously this is what we do. We get paid for what we do. But at the same time, I've known a lot of these people a long time. I know they don't have, you know, necessarily big, huge budgets to, to do these things. And I'm going, if I can do it, I'll do it. Sure. Yeah. I'll, I'll play, you know, I mean, it's, you know, ultimately again, you know, that's not, I don't mean to, and I don't think anybody, any of us should be demeaning or diminishing what we do uh, as our career and go like, Oh, well, because, you know, one aspect I think of the music world and uh, is, is that it's in and of, of itself, music has been diminished in terms over the years now in terms of its economic uh, payout or sure. reward. And um, I'm not in favor of that. I don't agree with it. I think, you know, every artist on every, whether you're a writer or an actor or a musician or whatever, should be paid for what you do. But right. at the same time, you know, we're in extraordinary times. And, and certainly with my friends, you know, if somebody's got something they want me to be involved in, and I certainly have the time, then I'm going to, I'm just going to do it. So, yeah. And I think the payout of all that comes later because people will remember that, you know, and a big pro a big part of everything that I've done my whole life. And I'm sure I know it's true for you, Tim, with your company and everything is networking, you know yeah. what I mean? And, and when you, you know, to, th that's just part of what we do. You know, that's the biggest, I will say that's the, for me, the biggest awakening awareness, if I didn't know this before, and I've, I've said this before, but now I really truly know it and believe it is like, I did not. I mean, look, I'm blessed to have this studio. It's awesome. But I didn't get into music to sit in this studio by myself and play the tracks. Yeah. Yeah. Of other people. I want to be with people. I want to I want to be recording. I want to be playing live with people. Yeah. It, that's why I got into music. Yeah. And kind of what I hear you also saying is like the, the days of exposure bucks are, are over. Like as far as like, you know, okay, you need to do this to, you know, for exposure or for, for, uh, you know, you can, you can kind of collect projects or you can accept projects that, um, are, are, um, not necessarily worthwhile for you, but maybe more meaningful for you. Mm -hmm. And, and you've yeah. gotten to that point where, okay, well, you're you're doing it to work with people you're doing it to um 
kind of collaborate and more of a humanitarian <laughs> aspect, like being able to like communicate with people musically. On, yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I, you know, maybe in, in some big spiritual or metaphysical aspect of it, you know, look, it, what we do is not rocket science, man. It's not yeah. hard. A friend of mine calls it brain. He, you know that expression, it's not rocket science or it's not brain surgery. A friend of right, mine right. says it's, it's not brain, or no, he says rocket surgery. Rocket <laughs> like, surgery, right? <laughs> but, yeah. but at any rate, um, I, I mean, I'd like to feel like, you know, like what we do, or in this case, what I'm doing is of some importance. And, so, yeah. and sometimes it's hard to get, it's easy to get lost in all that with, everything that's going out on in the world yeah. but music is true is really really man is so important for people yeah on whatever level you're going to identify with. and i'm not talking about just as a musician i'm talking about just as your everyday lay person right. who just loves music for and and then at that point there's it's it's not an objective issue it's it's very subjective you know what yeah. i mean it's like you don't have to explain to me why you like a particular artist and and it, it's not it doesn't make any difference does it touch you and that's all that matters yeah you know like i mean somebody could look at a monet and go like Ugh, really seriously and they right. look at you know somebody else and they go like oh my god that's the greatest thing i've ever seen in my life and it's like somebody else is going like that is the ugliest yeah. i would never buy that i want to see it. you know so it's <laughs> yeah, i guess being yeah being being touched either positively or or negatively like some sort of emotion that it it evokes yeah. it is important yeah for sure so so it, i mean so if i if i feel like there's something that i can bring to the table it's this is it this is what i do yeah. so uh, you know i play music man i don't know how to do anything else at this point in my life <laughs> right you know what i mean so yeah. and so if somebody wants me to you know i'm honored that people will you know, want to work with me and, and uh, on whatever level. And I'm going to jump at that opportunity, particularly like when it's something that, you know, like, oh, you better go do this. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Not be, be outside of your, your friends and stuff, because, you know, you, you that's your that's your comfort zone. You know, sure. So. I was talking to um, uh, a couple episodes ago to Lineage Percussion, and they're like a young uh, percussion trio. Yeah. And in a, this same topic just kind of organically came up that, you know, they had a really good point that we're almost in multiple pandemics right now. You know, it's, you know, obviously COVID, but then, uh, you know, the racial injustice and riots yeah. that are happening. And then obviously, yeah. you know, the, uh, the upcoming, uh, the impending election. So, which will, by the time we're probably people are listening to this has passed. So we'll see, we'll see what happens, but, um, yeah, right. uh, we're kind of in the middle of, of almost several pandemics and we've had this conversation at work, like, you know, after, you know, George Floyd was murdered and um, kind of the people that were working there was myself and a guy, Jamel, who's VP of operations. Oh. And then Eric, okay, who's yeah. the president, <laughs> really the only three of us that were going in at the time because um, we were pretty we were pretty still shut down from everything. And and it's like, wow, man, we're we're going to try to put together tambourines right now. You know, we're going to we're going to try to <laughs> I gotta try, I know, to sell, go try to sell wood blocks right now. Like yeah. what's you know. But I What's think important, yeah. exactly. But what lineage was kind of saying and what I hear you saying also is like, you know, the arts are important. What we're doing is important. It kind of transcends like being a musician or being it, it, it goes down to the kind of everyday everyday person, like whether you're a musician or not and how this kind of affects your life and what we're doing is important, whether we're we're, you know, recording drums or percussion tracks or we're building snare drums, you know, we're still kind of part yeah. of what's keeping everybody going. So, so I feel better about myself now, I guess. I'm thinking yeah, about that listen, way. <laughs> I, no, and I, no, listen, man. I mean, and, and, you know, hats, I have to say, because, you know, companies all, all everywhere are just folding right and left and hats off to you guys for being for doing what you do first of all because yeah. your products are amazing thanks and i'm not just saying that because i'm doing an interview with you right now <laughs> i mean i seriously mean that you are a I black first... swamp artist yeah, yeah I, so I, I, and, I appreciate and, you saying it yeah <laughs> no but and it's not easy man it's i know it's not easy yeah. and um uh and you're doing it so you know keep doing what you do man because you're 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 your instruments are amazing and yeah. um 
And again, I know it's not an easy road to go to go like, you know, because some people would be like, you know, like me when I built this studio at one point, I was like, right. what am I doing? I'm building a recording studio, but I lost my mind. What the? Yeah. You know, so um, but, it, you know, in hindsight, it was the best thing I ever did. So, yes. you know, once I had a, uh, it came to in a different and not, not I don't want to say I'm not unattached because I'm seriously attached, but right. um, but came to a different awareness about this whole thing than, sure. than, and, and acceptance with it. And then I was like, oh, OK, yeah. I'm, now I'm good. But yeah, you know. and our I mean, our process over the last several months, um, I mean, we're, we're recording this at the end of October and we're still not operating with a full, full team yeah. or or full hours. And um and that's unfortunately, you know, kind of by design right now, because we do, we want to make sure that we, we sustain this and, and everybody, you know, top down, uh, you know, president Eric through Jamel, myself and the other handful of guys that are work for, uh, working for us have made and are still making like sacrifices right now. And that's sure. to keep, keep the company moving. So, um, but I, so I appreciate our whole, whole team too here. Like we're, we all oh, know like yeah. what's happening is is out of our control i mean like most everything but it's not it the whole world is kind of obviously suffering from this and bit like you're saying businesses have gone under or are really struggling so we're just kind of keep doing what we can do to 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 keep it moving and and fortunately things are you know since the fall are kind of picking up this is our normal kind of busier season so oh, okay. um so it's oh, kind of naturally picked up when schools kind of pick back up yeah. and you go like, oh, yeah. Need, and you, yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So, well, and you know, it's something else that I think that's, that's, again, if we didn't know, I mean, right. you hear it, a cliche thing, it takes a village, you know, whatever. <laughs> right. And you know, and until, you know, like, okay, great. You know what I mean? But now we know what that means. If we yeah, don't know sure. what it means, we haven't been paying attention. Yeah. You know, because I can't do what I do without all this stuff. Sure. Of which you're a huge part of. Yeah. So, um, you know, and uh, which leads me, I was going to talk about like when I did, uh, for example, two years ago now, the Game of Thrones tour. Right, right. And uh, and I talked to you about getting a having the because when I when I worked with Ramin Javadi, who's the composer of Game of Thrones, and he was putting that tour together and we were trying to figure out well what's what are the setups going to have there was three percussions mine and two other two others. right and side note sorry i haven't i'm late to the game i have not finished the series yet so don't no spoilers um, okay, okay keep going uh, no, <laughs> definitely no spoilers okay keep going yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I won't i won't talk about any of the storyline Okay, so the multi bass, which is like, let me just tilt that guy down there. Which is, well, I got a little muting head, mute, mute sure. that I made for it on it, but that's that's the the multi bass, dude, is one of your most is amazing instruments. Yeah, and thanks. When I got a hold of this, my I already had it, but um, then I talked to you about using getting one from you for the for the tour. Um, I had to have this man because I mean, well, you're hearing it right now, but oh, for sure. You know, so let me turn my snare as well, but I mean this instrument and now I have a, and I have a mute on, on it right now, this little thing I made, but uh, but I mean this drum is just I've used this so much on so many different things, man. Right. This was the perfect instrument to in you know, to in, embellish this setup that I had, which was I had a had a bass doom doom. In, in that setup, I had a had a, had a big concert bass drum. I had the, had a Remo table drum. I had the multi bass. These things, man, it was like I it was like the perfect complement to these instruments that we need for the music that Ramin wrote. You know. Yeah. And um, so, uh, you know, again, so that was going back two years ago when I did that when I did that tour, uh, 2019. Um, and so, uh, or sorry, 18, 2018. Okay. And then. Um, so, you know, and, and of course, you know, everything else that you do, instruments. So we can't do, it does take a village. And that, that's my original point was, right. you know, you, like, you need people to play your instruments. And all the musicians, no matter what that you play, need instruments. Yeah. So it, it's this, <laughs> net, it's this weird, here we go with the networking thing. It's like, I have a studio. I can't record without microphones. So I need gear you know what right. i mean i need a computer i need outboard gear i need software i need whatever and um and you know 
uh, so it does take, we can't do this. You cannot survive in this day and age on your own. I, you yeah. just cannot. And so anybody who thinks they can, I think they, they need to change their thinking because it takes everybody to come together to make stuff happen. And I'm just hoping that, you know, we can, that more and more people, you know, with the division that's going on in the world right. can, um, can realize that coming together through a thing like music and with all this stuff that's available to us. And if it's not music for you, if it's dance or if it's acting or if it's writing or if it's just something creative mm -hmm. so that we are not focusing our energy on stuff that's so negative and dark that we're putting it into something that's creative and positive. So, yeah. And that's, that's been, you know, that's sort of one of my themes. And in fact, the, the band that I, uh, I think you know that, that I had, that one of the bands I'm in, um, Opium Moon, we won a Grammy two years ago, back in 2019, um, or a year and a half ago, whatever. Um, uh, that's kind of our message with that music, uh, is, is, you know, love, positivity, you know, changing people's, you know, whatever, energies. Right. <clears throat> so... Um, yeah, we call that, at least in our, um, in, at Black Swamp, we call the right people on the right bus. Like, you know, as far as like, we're, you know, we're in manufacturing, you know, and not only do you have different personalities, but you have people with different strengths. So, you know, mine, my strength had never been like straight up manufacturing, like mm -hmm. the, the sort of heavy lifting, I call it sometimes like really yeah, right. the, the heavy woodworking. Um, and so I naturally kind of gravitated towards yeah, the more personal like uh, relationships, you know, the, you know, building sales, building mar marketing efforts, yeah. uh, uh, building artists and educator programs and stuff like that. So, you know, need somebody like me to, to start doing that. And then, you know, then there's the guys that just gravitate naturally towards the woodworking. I mean, we're always a manufacturing first. So that's, I had to learn how to do some, some stuff back in the day of being Eric's basically first employee. Um, so I did have to learn how to use machinery and tools and stuff, but it yeah. was never, it was never like my, my focus. Um, so, and then, so we call it the right people on the, on the, on the right seat in the bus. So we're in this company, we're moving, cruising down the road in this big bus and we got to make sure we have the right people sitting in the right spots. You know, whoever's driving, somebody else might be driving at different times. You know, we, we hit a rest stop and we got, we all get off and then somebody yeah. else will be driving the bus, whatever. But so, um, but yeah, we're basically, we're a little village, man. And we're, we, I wouldn't but, be able to do what I'm doing without help from Nathan, who who does all our social media stuff and helps with marketing efforts and kind of branding and stuff. And then, or Jamel, who I bounce a lot of ideas off of for marketing, yeah, but yeah. we also work really closely together on manufacturing. And, and I'm, I know, obviously, Eric, the owner, and, um, you know, we've been working closely together for years. So, um, yeah, we definitely couldn't do it without each other. So we're we're like a little micro, you know, a micro colony, you know, ourselves. Um, so, and, and you have to do that. I mean, you're yeah. running a business, so you can't, nobody's going to know about you in this day and age. Yeah. So unfortunately we have to play <laughs> the social media game. Yeah. You know, you guys more so than maybe me, because you know, I'm, I've been around Los Angeles a long time. So a lot of people yeah. know me, but it still doesn't mean that, you know, if I'm trying to get, as I say, clients, meaning people that I'd like to, you know, record for or work with, or maybe right. even write with or something from elsewhere, um, you know, how are they going to know about you? Right. You've got to play, oh, yeah. unfortunately, you have to play the social media game at least to some degree. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, uh, to be straight up with you, you know, I'm on, because I'm older <laughs> than you and a lot of people <laughs> would play that game. Yeah. Um, it doesn't come naturally for me. Yeah. So it's funny, we're talking about this because just this morning when we were getting ready to set up, like, for example, the technology we're using right now for me to come to you and have these mics over my instruments and stuff coming to you is because of my uh, assistant and engineer, uh, Lucas Faring. Okay. And I couldn't do this stuff without him, man. There's no way. Yeah. I, I mean, first of all, we're, I'm in two different places. I mean, he's in my control room. But, and so there's stuff going on in there for we us to be able to send you this signal beyond just over my iPad. Yeah. And that all has come to pass because of him and then i have two other assistants that help me in the, my studio from time to time man and so again it takes people and i want to be around people man i want to create but the other thing we were talking about this morning is um <clears throat> the strengths and weaknesses of of people so in your company for example you've got eric who's the owner and he created this thing but now 
he might not be great. Maybe he does re is really good at social media, but I have a right. tendency to think that he's probably not as good as it. If he is oh. even into it at all, not right. as good as the guy who's handling it. Yeah, yeah. Who's and Jamal's handling it. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, back in the day when we were like, "Oh, Facebook, what's that?" Like, yeah, yeah, yeah pretty same. pretty much. It was my it was my game. So yeah, sure. started yeah started Facebook and Instagram and YouTube and and then started integrating all this into the promotions that we were doing. But several years ago, we hired a guy, Nathan, who Nathan, yeah. is, okay. is, you know, he's a whippersnapper. He's a younger kid and just yeah. was born into it, you know, and, and, and it comes natural. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And so he under it's all more intuitive for him. And then I pre pretty much, um, you know, handed over the reins. So he just, you know, I feed him content or we talk about mm -hmm. kind of the marketing stuff we have going on. And then he just. He just cruises and does all the Facebook and IG, IGTV and, and oh, grids, oh, wow. grids yeah. and posting and, and, and stuff like that. So yeah, he's see, pretty much runs like with a, it. That's even a new, a newer thing, right? IGTV, <laughs> yeah. which, yeah. you know, I mean, how's, what's that been around five, not that long. No, I mean, a couple not of years. As long as you, yeah. Not yeah. as long as YouTube for sure. Right. So it's, it, that's a new uh, avenue that um that can be uh um uh, promoted and 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 you know just gone down you know so right. um and again you have to have people handling stuff so so when i so for me like when i'm working in the studio i can record myself in fact i just had to the other day at the last minute a friend a friend of mine contacted me and said hey man i need some uh, some it's a latin thing and i just dude i'm not liking the programming that i did could you put some timbales and you know originally he just wanted me to put some timbales down i said yes yeah. i mean the thing i'll do it you know and of course it took me like three times as long to do it by myself <laughs> right. as it would have if i had lucas in there but yeah but at any rate um but again look at all the hats everybody's got to wear these days too yeah yeah um you know you have to i mean as running your company you're wearing a bunch of different hats as a as a musician i don't only play and i gotta i gotta stay up on the instruments that i play but then there's the whole recording and technical side of stuff. And right. man, it's, you know, some, and so the point gets back to, again, like if you're not great at that, then you need to surround yourself and have people available to you, if not all the time, yeah. at least available to you who can help you and then help you facilitate that so that you can do what you do even better. Right. So, you know. Um, no, I'll, I, I couldn't agree more. I try <laughs> and, and I, I mean, I fully admit sometimes there's a little bit of ego involved because it's like, oh, I used to, I used to do that, you know, and then it's like, okay, I need my, my wife calls it uh, getting under somebody's pinata, meaning like <laughs> if somebody does something like really good, you want to be there under them and like enjoy, you know, yeah, yeah, let it, let all that the candy, rewards. yeah, let all that candy <laughs> fall down on you, but like, and then lift them up and be like, hey man, that was, that was great. You're doing an awesome job. So I do try to, yeah, keep that in mind and, and definitely surround myself with, um, well, with Nathan <laughs> to, uh, to help with, to help with all that. But, um, yeah, so, uh, I tried stepping backward a little bit into COVID. I, I thought I was going to be the next MB Gordy when, when I, I first had to shut down cause I, I had drum mics and stuff and I never got into recording or like kind of figuring all that out, you know, using, uh, right now using garage band, but you know, maybe logic and, you know, stepping up and sure. using logic and stuff like that. And it, that, if I know you I ever got, have any, if you ever have any questions about any, particularly logic, I'll yeah. hook you up with my assistant, Lucas. Yeah. Cool. He knows logic inside out pro tools. We can both help you with him yeah. more so than me, but we well, with that it was just getting my feet wet, you know, like, okay, here, how am I going to set up my mics where are they going to go? And, you know, and, uh, and then, you know, I did a couple of recording things with like a friend or something or my brother-in-law is a guitar player and he sent me some tracks. So we were kind of collaborating a little bit and then it, and then of course it just kind of fizzles out or you get sidetracked or now I start going back to work, you know, in, yeah, right. in, in, you know, late spring. So I got it all set up. So I'm just waiting. I'm waiting for the calls to roll in really. So I <laughs> I, <laughs> wait, okay, I'm, not, I'm not actually going to put myself out there or, or work at it, but, <laughs> but in this, Maybe we can, I do want to get a little bit of your background, but so maybe sure. we can tie this in, like, like putting yourself out there or like, I mean, I mean, you were talking about, you know, you're obviously a professional, you know, freelance musician, basically, and, you know, recording and you have your own studio, like professionally, how did you start to kind of put that together to, or network as we were saying, like, how okay. did that, how did that kind of work out for you? Um, 
Well, there's a couple of things. I mean, a lot of it has to do with, you know, like your, your connections from colleges and, and all sure. that, right? So, so my background was um, I went to a few different schools trying to find my way, figure out what I was doing. Um, then there was a whole bunch of different stories there, which I, I don't know if we have even time to get into, <laughs> no. them, so we won't do that. <laughs> but anyway, fine. but yeah. the school that I finally went to and graduated from, it was in New Jersey, um, was a school called Glassboro State. Uh, college in uh, in uh, Glassboro, New Jersey. Okay, and that, that's what it's called then. Now it's called Rowan University. It's oh a place yeah, yeah. Like ex massive expansion. Yeah. Sure. I mean, I went there uh, in 2018 when we were playing on the East Coast. Okay. And I went and, and sat in with the with the lab band that that uh, and my friends now guys that I went to school with are yeah, now cool. running that. Yeah, great. And teaching at the college and stuff. So it was great to see them again, and. Um, and then I, I spoke and I played and stuff with the big band. But um, I, I was like, I, I, when I, we pulled into that town, I was like, I, I didn't even recognize anymore. It's like <laughs> the town is now the university. Yeah, sure. It's insane what they've done. It's amazing. Uh, very yeah. impressive, too. And they've got a whole medical thing. And it, I'm kind of interested in that because my daughter wants to be a doctor. So okay. they've got a whole medical thing going. I'm thinking, hmm, let's see. If I <laughs> donate some money to the school, can I get my daughter yeah. into college? Yeah, <laughs> like, right, whatever. right. Um, but anyway, uh, the MB, so that, the MB Gordy <laughs> wing of recording sciences or something yeah, yeah, like that. Yeah, right. 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 Um, so, um, anyway, so that was, that was there. So while I was there, I auditioned to two different schools. I auditioned, uh, and both, I didn't go in person. I, and probably not the wisest decision, but this is what I had at my available to me. So I did a tape audition at that time. There was real tape um to uh eastman school of music for graduate school and because i wanted to go study with john beck and i also wanted to but i wanted to go with to, to play in the, in the study in the jazz program there and then uh but my percussion teacher at the time a general by the name of joel thome who had gone to eastman and knew john beck as well um <clears throat> was really trying to push me to go to california institute of the arts and he told me to apply and i did mm -hmm. and i did not get accepted to eastman and i got accepted to cal arts so it was kind of a no-brainer and right. then so i was out of school for a year and i took a gap year and then i went to uh, graduate school at cal arts and you know never looked back it was one of the best you know i studied with john bergamo there and i'm sure you, you know who he is and of course all yeah. your um, if they don't, if the younger players don't know who John is, they should, because John was a, I mean, it, it was crazy because I had studied out of his books, his mallet book and, you know, all this stuff when I was in undergraduate school with Joel okay. and, and Joel was pushing me to go study with, with John and plus the world music thing. And that's where I really got way heavy into the world music thing there okay you know so i studied um specifically ghanaian the african music i studied when i was there was with the lezepko brothers and that was um ghanaian drumming they're they're uh, they were uh, the chief and the brother of the chief of a tribe from ghana so um so it was and so i got to study with those guys there and then i studied with i studied balinese and javanese gamelan and i studied um north indian uh music uh, with a gentleman by the name of Taranath Rao, with Tabla with Taranath Rao, and the uh, North Indian like Sargam and um, and um, North Indian ensemble with a gentleman by the name of Amya Dasgupta. Who, if anybody knows anything about the Beatles, they knew that they you know went through that period of time where they became friends with Ravi Shankar and blah blah right. blah blah blah. Right? Yeah. So Ravi, one of his disciples uh, as a sitar player, was this gentleman uh, Amya Dasgupta. And they had asked uh, during the time when they did that tune and, and it was around the record that uh, without, Within You, Without You was on where it's the tabla and the sitar playing. Okay. And George Harrison's playing the sitar on that. So they needed a tabla player. Amia, who was a tabla, a tabla as a sitar player, actually played tabla. Oh, wow. Record. Okay. Yeah, cool. And so, so it's like, here we are. It's like, I, I'm studying with, I mean, that's good to play with the Beatles, man. You yeah. know, like, so he yeah. had stories. It was great. Um, so this is the kind of, that was my background. And then when, it, when I first came out here, uh, I'd taken uh, some lessons with some other people, Peter Erskine and, um, and, uh, and um, uh, Luis Conte, you know, for a bit. Um, and then, but that was, I think that, yeah, that was after I was at, yeah, that was after I was at CalArts. But anyway, um, and then, you know, so then you graduate, you 
kind of make your way, you start making it into town. So all these people that I knew from college, you know, now they've all gone off, you know, and, and everybody's doing different things. Some people breaking into trying to break into the studio scene, which right. by the way, <clears throat> before I moved to California, I, you know, I knew about the studio world because of records. I never thought about it in the sense of film and TV music. Okay. You know, you knew about it. I mean, Star Wars had come out by then and, right. you know, and, uh, you know, just whatever, all this music and you go, oh, it's amazing music. But, you know, I wasn't thinking, of, yeah, you could make a living as a, as a studio musician playing film and TV music. You know, it wasn't part of my radar. My radar was like, man, I wanted to be in the Beatles. You know, like, I, you know, <laughs> right. I grew up listening to Led Zeppelin and yeah. Jimi Hendrix and James Taylor and Elton John and the list is on and on and on. And, and I knew, like, all these different records of, like, um, early on um, uh, Brecker Brothers and all that kind of stuff, right? The fusion right. stuff out of New York. And I could tell you all these different records who played on it, you know, and that's the world I knew about being a studio musician. Right. And so anyway, so I'm out here and I'm studying with John. And then it was like, wait a minute, you know, like, and I, then I started getting into really heavily Frank Zappa's music and John had played on a Frank Zappa record and he had played. And so that's where I first started learning uh, Zappa's music was learning the, the first piece I ever learned by Zappa was the black page. Oh, geez. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had to, we had was part of the deal, you know, yeah. if you're playing and if you're studying with John, you're going to yeah. study the black, you're going to study yeah. Zappa's music. I got to work with, that was another story after I graduated, I got to audition for Frank on drum set, I didn't get the gig, oh, wow. Chad Wackerman got the gig. That was an awesome experience. Well, and well, did, yeah. If I, there's if there's anyone to lose a gig to, I guess Chad Wackerman will. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, and then I got to, but I did get to work with Frank with, and I'll tell you that story in a second. But anyway, so, but again, see how that, what I'm talking about with the, with the networking thing. Oh, and by the way, I got to that audition with Frank because of, it was a closed audition. So my teacher at the time, John Bergamo knew about the auditions and said, Hey, I called Frank and told him you should come audition. Right. So that was an entree that way. As well as the guy, the gentleman I studied who became really good friends with, Joel Thom, in from uh, undergraduate school, um, had become, this was weird, when I first started studying with him in undergraduate school, he literally stopped playing percussion. Mm. He wanted to be only conducting. Okay. But he was teaching percussion. So part of the, there was a whole psycho thing, psych, psych thing going on there of like, right. I'm going to study percussion percussion with a guy who stopped playing percussion what <laughs> he was insane man i mean yeah. it was like what this guy could do you walk into a lesson and you're going like seriously and he wasn't professionally playing percussion anymore he really want he had studied with belez and he he and he started this uh new music um, group called orchestra of our time and blah 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 anyway joel had become frank's conductor for all the classical music con okay. or i say classical but you know all the orchestrated stuff right. that frank was breaking into getting orchestras to play his music so um so between the two of them that's how i got into that audition in the first place because yeah. otherwise it, i wouldn't have known about it and i wouldn't have been invited <clears throat> so um but then i got to work with frank in a, a different way later but um so all that to say that coming up through all that and then you go like oh well wow, there's a whole music scene out here of like guys that are in the studios all day long, you know, do, and then plus, and I've always liked, in, liked to play live as well anyway. And I always play, have played drum set. Now, the thing was when I went to Cal Arts, there was no jazz program there at the time. And any drum set playing I did was on my own. I was studying, you know, 20, world music and 20th century at the time, right. that would be 21st century, but 20th century <laughs> music, you know, all the, all the, you know, and, and, um, you know, Earl Brown and, you know, all those composers and, uh, Morton Zubotnik was the head of the, of the faculty there. So I got to play, uh, I got to play a lot of Mort's music. I got to play on, on one, maybe two of his records. I mean, I, that opportunity would have never happened otherwise you know yeah and i love that kind of music you know and it's not everybody's cup of tea i understand that i played a bunch of lucas foss and and um and john and and of course john cage being one of the biggest yeah. composers at that time of that stuff which is that was more minimalist but um but that's you know and then that's where i first got on just turned on to steve reich's music and and so you know all those um influences 
from early days of, of college all the way through, you know, from, and, and, that, and that was in that world. But then there was like, you know, I remember when I was the first undergraduate school I went to um, before I left there was um, Towson State in uh, Baltimore, Maryland. And that's where I first heard Light as a Feather by Chick Corea. Okay. And that was, you know, a life-changing record for me. So there's been all these steps along the way, so of, of that. But um, and so um, anyway, so fast forward, move up to you know, I'm living in California now, and then so it was like it was like I'm in my last year of college. What am I going to do? Right. And um, I don't know. I was on a trip back east, and it was just one of those New York. I was flying. I was taking a bus from the West Side Terminal after JFK. And riding through Queens, and I'm just looking, and it was like, you know, overcast and dismal day, you know, whatever. And I'm just going like, I can't live here, man. I love New York but yeah. now, but at the time, I was like, I can't live here. There's no trees. <laughs> <laughs> right. I was like, I can't live in yeah. New York. Yeah. And so that was kind of it. I was just like, okay, I guess I'm staying in California, and the rest was history. I mean, I yeah. just, you know, and then it was like from, from uh, I, I worked at CalArts for uh, two years after I graduated there um helping john out in some respects but then i was also head of the uh, music doing music production okay for the um for the uh, for the um music uh, department so i was kind of in charge of running all the shows and any ensemble any any concerts at all that came through that department i had that i was the guy you had to go through right. and so i got my chops together in that and so i know that i can do that i did that i did it really well i mean and they love me but it was like hello the, the what they were paying me i couldn't make a living doing that it was like below the poverty level at the time so i had to stop and i was like and at one point i finally came to the like the awareness was like wait a minute i have a master's degree in music to play music, not to work doing production sure, you know, sure. at, a, at a music school. So that's when it was like, okay, I'm moving into Los Angeles. And that's what that, and then it was stepping stone, stepping stone, stepping stone all along the way. So one question, I mean, we're just talking about obviously like networking and knowing people and, and meeting people and getting out there. Um, Sometimes when I'm talking to when I'm I'm not sure if we were recording yet earlier, but I was talking about at some point before our, our during our conversation, I was talking about going out and doing like show and tells or doing like our what I call them petting zoos. So I'll go to schools and universities and and a lot of times, you know, college or high school kids will ask, you know, how did you get involved in Black Swamp? Or, you know, you're really lucky to be able to work for a company and a percussion company and still be in uh, involved in percussion and I still play music sometimes like I would consider you like really uh, you know you're really lucky to have all these experiences and and then and I kind of tell them well yeah I guess I'm I'm lucky but I almost feel like I made my own luck in a sense because <laughs> because I yeah. worked I worked hard and I wouldn't have had an introduction to Eric the owner if I wasn't really applying myself in school and and kind of uh, uh, you know my professor at the time knew that I was a hard worker and that I would be reliable and that I'm loyal and and stuff so I mean do you do you consider that too you know maybe you are lucky in a sense but also you yeah. you, you made your own luck uh, to get to what you're doing now or where you are now yeah I, uh, absolutely Tim, it's a. I, I think it's a combination of both, and, sure. and to just uh, uh, <laughs> on the back of that comment, right. uh, not to name drop, but Patrick Swayze when he was when he was alive, I, I knew him pretty well. Okay. And uh, from some, because uh, one of the reason I met him is because one of the things I did when I was at CalArts to help supplement my income, and sure. this was even when I was on working at CalArts after okay. I graduated. I was accompanying a lot of dance classes. Now, me and a bunch of percussion friends, buddies of mine, still this who are all, we're all still friends today, yeah. um, did that when we were in undergraduate school together. Uh, or, sorry, in graduate. Well, I was in graduate school. These guys were in undergraduate school, but um, it still, still we were at CalArts together. And one thing that we did to supplement our income was play dance classes, and it was it was like awesome because it was a jam. I mean, it was great. Right. So we got to play percussion. We're getting paid to play percussion, man. And we're company dancers. How bad could that be? Yeah. You know, this is good. So um, because of that, one of the dance teachers at Cal Arts also taught privately at a place called The House in Santa Monica, playing for him, a gentleman by the name of Nicholas Gunn. So I'd be playing in his classes. And 
all kinds of people will be coming through his classes. And, you know, from are we getting to Patrick Swayze here? Because I can't wait yes. to hear how we get yeah. to Patrick Swayze. <laughs> that, that's how I got to Patrick okay. and his wife Lisa come in to take yeah, class. Yeah, cool. And uh, and I was like, and then the next thing I know, I'm going out to lunch with him. And the next thing I know, I'm invited over to the house. Next thing I know, he wrote a thing. Anyway, yeah. Patrick's line was, we called him Buddy, but his right. his, uh, his line was, there is no such thing as luck. You make your own luck. Yeah, he was cool. pretty hardcore about that. Yeah, interesting. Um, and it's I it, listen. What it comes down to is the hard work that you put into what you've done, do. And, and are doing and the, and and everybody else you know that, that comes around like what we've done you know like um and and all all of it's kind of comes together so yeah on the one hand yeah we're we're, we're blessed that we have the opportunities we get but mm -hmm. you you cannot stay again like be an island and go like oh i'm just gonna lock myself away i mean i heard this when i was in undergraduate school you could be the gre greatest player on the planet if you're not out there doing pe and people don't know who you are by some way, shape or form, yeah, you're going to stay the greatest player ever and no one's going <laughs> to know. No it. one's in, yeah, sure. So it, it all comes down to that, you know, so I think it's through experiences. Yes, we're, you know, it's yet yeah, people do seem to be luckier than others and get different opportunities and maybe bigger and better opportunities than others. Yeah. But at the same time, you cannot get any opportunities if you don't put yourself out there. Maybe a year ago and you're recording uh, like percussion parts for a movie score would you be doing it in a, a separate studio like with other musicians or would you be doing it alone in your studio now? Um, uh, both. Um, yeah. So they started doing this thing called striping. And I believe if I'm not mistaken, uh, Hans Zimmer with his engineer at the time, uh, Alan Meyerson were the first people to do that. Now I, I could be wrong about that, but I believe that was the situation. I think it was an, an Alan Meyerson thing where they wanted separation. So that now with COVID, because you can't have big orchestras right. together, I mean, you can have a string section together and then they'll do the brass separately and then they'll do the woodwinds. Separately. And so we do percussion separately and it works out nicely anyway, because right. that now we're totally isolated. Okay. And I've done, we just did a movie called Plasma. So they did uh, the strings and the brass. And if there were woodwinds, they did those as well at Sony a couple weeks ago. But that following Sunday, when those sessions were done, we did all the percussion at a, at this place called East West, and so there was three of us on that doing doing percussion on that. So, um, and that's kind of what's going on. Everything's getting, and that's what you would call striping. So you're doing those sessions separately from the other. So instead of playing it all in the room together, which you can't do now, there's not enough space. Right. If every with social distancing, um, we have to do it that way. Yeah. Sure. Um. <clears throat> so. But I'm still doing, you know, more and more stuff here in the studio by myself as well. So I did, for example, you know, the movie uh, Despicable Me 2. Oh, yeah. That's my favorite one. Uh, yeah. Okay. So I did all the percussion on that here by myself. Oh, okay. Cool. Um, now, uh, I've done other movies in here. Wimp Diary of a Wimp with, with Ed Shermer, Di Diary of a Wimpy Kid, I think. Uh, I played on all of them, but I think we, but one, Wimpy Kid, one we did at a studio, two and three we did in, in at, at, at home, at my studio in a different okay. place. Yeah. Um, so it's, you know, it just, it, it would be, it just depended on what kind of isolation they wanted and did it make sense to do it this way. If you want that big room sound, you got to go to a place like Fox or, or Sony or, sure. or, um, or Warner Brothers. One thing that happened years ago when I did do work on Despicable Me 2 was I, div I figured out what sound was best because I had to kind of step it up a bunch to blend with what Alan Meyerson was recording because Alan Meyerson was also the recording engineer on that project. And I was recording here during the day doing percussion while they were at Fox doing um, uh, orchestra. And then I would sit when I was done in the afternoon, I would send all my stuff over the Internet to him. He'd fly it all in. And then 
play it in the studio, send it back over speakers in the room, and record that as well back into the tracks. <laughs> so yeah. it's like, du- like double recorded then. Yeah. Yes, but you heard that that natural ambiance and reverb and stuff that was just built into the room at Fox. Right. Yeah. And so when you heard it all back, you go like, man, sounds like I'm in the, my all my percussion was in the room with them. Yeah. It Sorry. was brilliant. So in that case, you are literally just, you're recording with a click, obviously. You have to mm-hmm. do that. And then you're just playing parts like you don't have a scratch track. You don't have any other type of musical uh, instrument that you're referencing or no, no, they work? send, they, they would send, they had, they had mock-ups of okay. everything. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. um, at that, yeah, at that point I did not have the real strings, or the real brass or anything. I was playing to mock-ups. Okay. But so that's, see, now that's another thing that you have to take into consideration when you're playing to these tracks is how tight everything is. Right. So two, there's two issues. The mock-ups you get need to be tight. Lucas and, and, and I both can tell you from experiences from some <laughs> stuff that we've done. Whereas trying to play the tracks that aren't mocked up uh, well. Yeah. And they didn't really, like, you know, it's, it's kind of... Because some samples just you know, attack late. Like brass in real life attacks late to the click, right? Mm-hmm. Because of what by the time that you put your air in the horn and it works its way through and comes out but strings tend to be late too a lot of times so um so samples really accentuate that so you've got to make sure you when you send your mock-ups out to your players i say you meaning anybody that's listening that's a composer right um that and and somebody's going to play to it that that's what you want it's it's not like oh i'll fix it later no 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 send the stuff the way you you want it to be now right so that when you're when you yourself or me or somebody else is playing on it that we know when we put our tracks on that that's it's locked up and it's supposed to be or we will then lock stuff up a lot of times we'll like if i'm doing a shaker track or i know that a particular project has got to be so like computer perfect that we'll um, a lot of times adjust the tracks, you know, digitally. Right. And, um, you know, like Beat Detective or, you know, basically quantizing it. Sure. Um, so that when it comes out of here, my stuff is clean. It's it, And I rarely put a lot of effects on stuff when I send it out because, I, you know, the people who are mixing it are going to want to do that later. Um, <clears throat> but uh, that it's, it's – so when it leaves my studio, I know that it, the performance is correct. It's a performance I'm happy with, and and um, and nothing stands out, and there's no mistakes, and there's no glitches, there's no popping, there's no – everything's right. got to be clean. So there's an amount of work that goes into it. Well, from, done, from having done it now as long as I've been doing it, and Lucas and I have been doing it together, um, we've got a system down that just goes really fast. Right. And, um, and then I know that when the people get the tracks, it's like – it's as good as I can get. It's 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 the best I can give you. Yeah. Um, I don't want anything going, to be honest with you, out now. That's just like, ah, I'm not gonna worry about that. Let them fix that later. You know, it's like, <laughs> no, I can't. I'm number one, I'm too old for that. And number yeah. two, it's just not you don't want that reputation. Yeah, for sure. And it you know it makes their job easier too, I guess. Obviously. Yeah, and exactly. it makes you look better. <laughs> It, yep. And again, it comes back to that thing. of like, hey, man, we're all in this thing together. And I want yeah. I want to make your job easy so that you don't have to call me up or have to, you know, and go like, hey, man, what, what, this thing, thing's not lining up or what did you do here? Or how, why'd you do that or whatever? I want to I want to just I, I'm playing your music now. And you asked a question, too, about like when you're doing all this stuff. Um, a lot of times, you know, I'm, I'm just playing the parts that they gave me. Yeah. And end of story, that's it. Play them. I get a performance I like. Send it back. It's good. Uh, a lot of times, and this happened with Bear McCreary in the early days of Battlestar Galactica, uh, um, that I got th- – th- he wanted very specific things played. That's w- what was in the music. And then conversely, there was like a lot of the tabla stuff and, and some other – things that i did on that on that score uh are those episodes the score of those episodes where i got to impro- improvise a little bit yeah so i would in that case then you know give them a couple passes because they might like this here and that there and that you know like 
you know, because improvisation, here we go again, is a very subjective thing. Somebody sure. might, you know, I, I, I might go like, oh, yeah, that was the bomb take, man. That was the great one. And they go like, no, I like the first one better. Yeah. So, you know, you get a little of both of that going on. Interesting. Well, okay, I got a bunch of questions right now. Okay. So, the first one, so how far in advance do you get scores then? So if you're working, if you're doing a movie, is this literally like, here's your score, and then you sight read it and, and record it um, and go? Or... Well, uh, a little of both. In the, yeah. in the old days, meaning when I was coming up, and certainly prior to that, and even into maybe the first 10 or even 15 years of my career, um, that's what you'd get. It, yeah. you're, you're going to a session and you're, you're sight reading. Yeah. Um, then all of a sudden they started, we started with, with the advent of, you know, once computers be, got more advanced and, you know, email and this and that and the other thing, you'll get a link to the music. So you can look at the music in advance. Okay. And that comes in handy sometimes, particularly <laughs> when it's like, you know, like uh, yeah, there's a sure. crazy hard timpani part or, you know, a really hard mallet part or just a, something that's just, you know, in odd time signatures that you just go like, oh, it's good to have known, you know, or yeah. you're looking and you're going like, okay, well, how's my part laid out? But anyway, um, so we need to, so we get our assignments and we know who's doing what in advance. So then we could go like, oh, I'm, oh, I'm playing drum set on all that. Okay. So I'll just look at all the drum set stuff sure. or I'm playing, um, you know, I got vibes on that and I'm playing concert bass drum, I'm playing bass drum and some dunes on this and whatever. So you get to kind of mentally sculpt out your part in advance. Um, how is, so yeah, like film versus TV, like what are those, how are those sessions different or how, how do you collaborate differently? Like you mentioned working with Bear McCreary, I think like, is that more collaborative or is it like they got all the episodes recorded or you know, in the can, if that's uh, oh, appropriate, no. appropriate lingo, or is this like you're working episode at a time type of thing? It's it was. Ep I think there might be some shows where they've they've already got an idea of what they want to do, and they're going to record a few shows right. at a time. But with Bear, with Battlestar, and with most of the stuff for TV, it's an episode at a time. Yeah, and um, and there may be, and it depends on on the episode too. There might be issues like I played on some episodes of Game of Thrones, but in pay, playing on them all, he programmed a lot of that stuff. Um, so, um, or there was, Bear did a show called Human Target, and there wasn't always drums or, or um, Agents of Shield. They oh, program yeah. programmed a lot of that stuff, but they won when then when it, like there was a couple episodes where they it took place in like the episodes took place in South America, and they really wanted like a real feel of like real drums, you know, the human element played sure. live. So I got to play on a few episodes of that, you know. Um, but uh, and then there was a show called Sarah Chronicle uh, Connor Chronicles based on the you know the original um, uh, Terminator movie. Sure. Um, uh, that. Uh, that happened on a on a on a show to show week to week basis, mm -hmm. and so um, so in terms of working with the composers, um, it varies with this whole COVID thing and with the whole remote recording. Is I don't preferably I would not like to get a day or two later and go like they go like oh man I finally heard those tracks can you um, I need it can you do X that I hadn't done before, right? I'd rather know that day while we're booked in the studio with my engineer, yeah. with, you know, so I know. So what we'll do is we'll do a rough MP3 mix. Not not a great mix, obviously, because I don't know what they're ultimately looking for in their mix, but just so that they can hear what I've done above their program stuff, or if there's live instruments, whatever. Um, and then we'll send it off, immediately send them an EP3, they, MP3, they can listen to it, give us notes, like, yeah, there's more or less of that. Yeah. Now, that's one way to do it, okay? And then they get back and they say, fix this, or no, it sounds great, move on. Yeah, right. Go on to the next queue. So, we'll do, so that becomes a little more time-consuming. But there's another thing you can do now as if they're there with you. We can do it this way, Zoom, Zoom, yeah. Zoom, right? Yeah, that was going to be one of my questions, almost like a real-time like, collaboration. Yeah, now yeah. I can't – you and I couldn't play together over Zoom, Right. right, but you could listen to what I'm doing, obviously. But to to amp that up a bit, there's a pro, a program by a company. Uh, the company's called Audio Movers, and their program is called Listen To, 
where it would be the same thing or similar thing where I'd be with you like this on video, but the audio instead of coming over Zoom is coming over audio movers. And I'm going to, okay. I can pursue this with you more and tell you about it later. And we could try it sometime if you want. So then you would hear really, really great quality audio coming back to you through audio movers. Sure. So let's say I'm working with, I mentioned Elizabeth Scott, or I, there's a composer I work with a lot, this gentleman by the name of Jack Wall. He turned me on to this. He's the, he he uh, is the first person we did this with. He's a big video game composer. Yeah, he done Mass Effect and Black Ops, if you play video games. Yeah. Um, anyway, Black Ops is a big series. It was like, see, he's here in real time this way. So he's hearing what I'm doing as I'm doing it. Yeah. And he can give me notes immediately. There's no downtime of like sending you an MP3 right. and listening to it and blah, 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 and waiting and then get back. Now, this way, he's right there. Yeah. So it seems like that would be the best way to do it, like it, to, to cut out a lot of the middleman. So, there's, so this whole thing of technology now, that was the other thing I wanted to talk about is like, now we, all of a sudden we have all this other stuff we got to worry about, man. We got to be yeah. a recording engineer. You got to know how to place mics. You got to know how to edit. You got to know there's, and, and obviously, I mean, there's so much of this stuff that I, I'm not that great at, which is why I'm thankful to have Lucas because he's the bomb. Right. And Lucas is also a percussionist. So he knows my style of playing. He knows my instrument collection, my basic sound and, and how I approach to what I do, particularly when I'm getting to pick my own instruments, because a lot of times people will send you tracks and I go like, well, here's what I program, man. But, you know, do your thing, use your instruments, do what you got to do, man. Right. And and so I might get into something and Lucas will go, hey, man, remember that thing you used on blah, blah, blah? Like, let's try it. We should try that. Oh, yeah. Man, cool. I didn't even think of that, you know. So so there's that element. So it's a nice teamwork thing going on there yeah. in that respect. Um, so, um, yeah, go ahead. No, I mean, that was kind of another jumping to another question I had. I mean, you, obviously, there's a ton amount of professionalism, like when you're putting your tracks together and you're make, making sure you want everything to go out like as as excellent as possible to represent yourself well. And um, and then you got to be really versed or proficient and then uh, um you know the software and hardware and sort of the technology aspect of it um you gotta we talked about putting yourself out there and social media and basically all these different entrepreneurial kind of skills or facets yeah. like yeah yeah like what else what other advice might you have for somebody that is trying to get into this line of work specifically that maybe we haven't touched yet or maybe we've touched everything <laughs> we've exhausted it all well uh you know, there's always more. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, 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 In this sure. case, more is more. Um, you know, uh, well, there's a lot to it. Um, you, you have to find something about what it is you can bring to what it is that you do for, sure. for someone else. Uh, that Not that it's so different from somebody else, but what is it that makes you special? You know what I mean? Like in my case, uh, you know, I, I love, I play a lot of different instruments and I, I know at this point what, what my strengths and weaknesses are. And that would be like, if you want a jazz, vibe, I mean, look, I play mallet instruments, but I'm not a jazz vibes player. Sure. You want me to play some drum set stuff? You want me to do any of this world? You want me to play a mallet part that you wrote? As long as it's not a George Hamilton Green xylophone solo. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you know, but I mean, I could learn that too. But, but, you know, that's for me, that won't be sight readable. Yeah. For Emil Richards, that would have been sight readable. Right. For some other percussionists I know in town, that's pretty almost sight readable. And see, yeah. that's the beauty of having a program like Pro Tools now yeah. or, you know, whatever DAW you're using, Logic, DP, whatever. I particularly like Pro Tools for audio because, yeah. and that's mostly what I'm doing. But for programming stuff, you know, I'm getting more and more into Logic. Um, so, and that's just, uh, yet yeah, just another, here we go. One yeah. more thing to learn. <laughs> like I'm, a, I'm playing percussion, but now I got to, I got to learn programming. You know what yeah. I mean? So, sure. I mean, I've, been, I've, I've toyed with it on and off for years, but now with some of the writing projects I'm doing, it's, it's, for, it's better for me to have even more facility with that. So it's just a matter of sitting down at the computer and doing it, you know? Yeah. And that's like anything. It's, it's the same as practicing. You know, uh, what did I, this is a great expression I heard just recently. 
it's like, oh my gosh, what was it? And it was not about music, but it applies to the same thing, which is like, well, the, the challenge about working out is getting actually putting on your sneakers. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I was like, that's pretty true with everything. That's brilliant. Yeah. I'm going to use that. So yeah. I just use it. Um, and that's what it is, man. It's like, you know, when you're practicing, what is your regimen? You know, like, what are you doing every day? You know, yeah. to, 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 number one, keep your chops together. Now, I play almost every day. So my practice regimen isn't what it used to be um, years ago. Uh, and But that constantly changes, too. As you know, you, you have children, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got okay, two. so you know that once you got married and once you had kids, everything changed. The time that you had to yourself all of a sudden doesn't <laughs> exist anymore. Yeah, for sure. You know, and that's an okay thing. I mean, otherwise, you... If that's if you're not going to accept that, you shouldn't have children. But, you know, but um, but once you embrace that, you have to realize, OK, my time is now a different entity. It's a different thing. Now, my kids are older now. They're not here anymore. So for me to go, I can't use the excuse of like, oh, I'm too busy with my family to practice or do whatever. Right. I don't have that excuse. I, got, I, I have other excuses. But <laughs> but um, no, but um, but so my my point is that as you know, with younger with, with all these people who are listening who might still be in school well we're all always in school i think but sure. but t physically in school right um is man take advantage of this time now while you've got this time to yourself put the hours in all go right. ahead you know you know i used to use the expression you know years ago now i don't mean it literally but you know i'll sleep when i'm dead yeah um because i used to put an insane amount of hours in uh, i mean I mean, for years, it, well into my career, because yeah. that's just the way I roll, man, and that's the way I like to work. Um, but you have to do that, you know, you, particularly when you're younger, because you get more responsibilities. Um, uh, your time becomes less and less your own. Yeah. No, I spoke with Mike Truesdell, who who is actually teaching at Ithaca now. Uh -huh. um, okay. Last year, for the podcast, and that was actually one of his points. That's what he tells all of his students like hey you're you're in school now you're paying to be here like why yeah. would you not invest uh, like your full <laughs> right. amount of like 110 plus percent into practicing exactly. or or trying to get gigs or trying to perform as much as possible or whatever so yeah it's a really good point um, yeah it's it's so it's so crucial to your development um and plus you know when you're younger you're brains less fogged up with all the other worldly <laughs> stuff. No, I'm serious, yeah, man. Yeah, with sure. all the other worldly stuff. Although, you know, now yeah. it's, everybody's brains fogged up with a lot of stuff that yeah. not, might not necessarily should be the case, but it is. Right. So we have to find ways to deal with it. So then you got to find ways to like, well, how do you empty that? You know, I mean, yeah, which is sure. where, you know, the whole meditation and I don't know, for some people it might be working out or swimming or bike riding or playing tennis right. or, you know, but something to get you, uh, Lucas just pointed out to me, we we're talking before this started about a, a, a TV composer who, uh, he works, his schedule is nine to five and at five o'clock he's done. Now, yeah. I don't know a whole lot of composers who work like that, but he's one of them who, yeah. who's able to figure that out. Um, so that he has a life outside of his daily routine so that he can now he's home. He can have dinner with his family. He can have spend time with his kids sure. and, you know, and then keep it, keep it rolling. And he's a very successful TV composer. So, yeah. so it worked out in his case. Other people don't do that. You know, everybody's got a different thing that they do, but yeah. Well, that was one, another question I, I like to ask people. So you've mentioned meditation. Is there anything else you use to kind of, refocus or or decompress sometimes like that that might be outside of the music world yeah well i, I love yoga and i i got turned on to yoga years and years ago when i was like 19 and uh, i i I've, i always say if i had regularly and not ever ever stopped doing it just kept growing and doing it every day yeah. i'd be like so god knows i probably own my own like yoga routine studio or something i don't right. know what i'd be doing now um but i didn't do that and there was period, long long periods of time where i was like ah, it's like yeah, i'm fine i'm done i'm not doing that now but then but i was always aware of it so years ago um when a yoga works opened it up near here uh when they first opened up near i live in tarzana california um i started going and i would go as much as i could at least three or four times a week um 
and then but then that was again you know you get super busy and you go like i can't go today and now with covid you know i started a workout routine back in the spring in the spring that kind of waned off a little bit but then I, my wife got into this thing called coyote yoga which i highly recommend okay and it's not like yoga as you like we all might know of you you're not going to do a downward dog <laughs> you're not going to do a vinyasa flow it doesn't exist in this type of yoga right. it's more about hips and as we get older you know uh and i i don't know how old you are tim but uh like, enough. yeah low back issues you know from from us sitting around all day long and hunching over and yeah. neck issues and hip issues and all this kind of stuff and particularly and the older you get it just exacerbates itself so uh this particular yoga really addresses those issues it's called coyote yoga i can't say enough great things about it so my wife got trained in it and so she pretty much does it every day and um i haven't didn't get up early enough this morning to do it but i'll be doing it later today so um, so, so between that um i like to take hikes when i can i like to play i'm not a great tennis player uh um, but I love to play tennis. I love to swim. So, you know, I, I try to balance all that stuff and I try to eat well and, uh, and, and eat healthy. Yeah. Um, I'm not a vegetarian or a vegan, but, uh, I, but we don't, I mean, we, we don't eat a lot of meat, red meat and, uh, you know, and we, you know, pretty healthy. Um, so, um, you know, it's, I think it's a balance of all that stuff. And that's another thing that I, that I highly recommend for people is to not ignore, uh, I don't care how old you are and how hard you're going to push yourself in terms of your schedule and sleep issues that you might have right. or get into because it's like, Oh, I got to practice. Oh, I got, yeah. I mean, like when I was, when I was at Cal arts, my day basically started at eight o'clock in the morning and I would go to bed at two or three in the morning and the next day it would be the same thing. And that was for two years straight. Yeah. Pretty much. Um, and and I see my son now, he's out of college, he's working. And I see that the kind of work schedules, I'm going like, dude, they're working you too hard. And then I remember, it's like, yeah, but he's 23. And, you know, like, <laughs> that's what, you know, you got to yeah. go through this now yeah. when you can. When he's right. 43 or even 53, you might not want to work those insane hours, you know. Yeah. Now, I was working those insane hours when I was 53. Right. I'm finally, I'm a little older than that now. But, uh, yeah. but um and I, and and so again, yeah, I can make the hours I want, you know, because again, here we are in COVID. There's everything yeah. so topsy turvy and different now. But but my point being that, um, you know, you you have to push yourself, and you got to do what you got to do. But you have got to take care of yourself, and you've got to, you know, with 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 whether it's through breathing or meditation or working out or some form of exercise, or you know, and and be able to clear your head get away from what you do so that when you come back to it it's clear and it's fresh you know otherwise sure. you know it's real easy to just kind of get fogged up about everything and so and then you don't have any clarity clarity about what it is you do and what the point of it is that you're doing right you know what you're doing so um so that's my little philosophy on that but yeah no it's it's cool my my I give my daughter a hard time. Our oldest is 13 and you know, uh -huh. she, so now she's, you know, she's got homework every night and, yeah. and, or, and I'll be like, Hey, did, you know, did you finish this? Well, you know, and she'll give me a hard time. Well, you, you stopped working and came home and, and watched Star Trek or something. I'm like, yeah, cause I went to school for, you know, you into that, my twenties and I, I slit, you know, my professor, motto was sleep when you're dead also <laughs> like um uh so i went to university of akron and and oh, okay yeah, sure. um and yeah so i lived you know i live that and now i i have an occupation i have a job i have a career you know i'm a part owner in a company and it's covid era so you know sometimes yeah man my we're not our hours aren't the same as what they used to be and our output isn't the same for whatever reason. So yeah, I came home and I watched uh, Star Trek for an hour or an hour, <laughs> whatever. That's fine. So when you're my age and you've paid your dues, you can you do pay that. some dues. Yeah. So um, yeah, man. Well, we've covered a ton of ground here. So I like, I appreciate you sharing everything. I mean, is there anything that you wanted to touch on? If you don't know, another instrument try to delve into it and i'm talking yeah, about sure. outside of a percussion instrument yeah 
you know, piano particularly, uh, even if it's just a basic knowledge. I mean, I, I did not get that growing up, and I wish I had. Sure. But that's hindsight. I didn't know. My parents didn't know. And so you can't know what you don't know. I mean, yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> that's you don't, impossible. Yeah, exactly. You don't know um, what you don't know. You, you can – and sometimes, you know, the expression ignorance is bliss – is really true you know it's right. it's sometimes it's 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 better not to know certain things <laughs> because then all it does is kind of frustrating and then if you're gonna let that eat you up it's like oh i never i never had this experience and blah 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 and then you're gonna like you're gonna hold that against yourself and the yeah. rest of the world that's like that's not gonna get you anywhere just right. take care of it man just then deal with it yeah you know yeah, what i mean at some point new- that's another thing my wife says. She's a lot smarter than I am. Uh, so she, she, <laughs> wife said to be that way. Yeah, yeah. She <laughs> says you don't should on yourself. Like I should have done this or I should have done that. Like, yeah. like you're saying, just just move on, man, and do what you're do what do it right next time or keep keep moving. For everybody, I highly recommend if you're in school and even if you're not, find some way to do this. Uh, take at least one, if not more, psychology classes. Uh, interesting sure and to understand people and i'm not talking about psychology learning like pavlo well you know, not that that's not important to know right. about that uh, uh, side of psychology but i'm talking about more the humanistic side um to understand where how people work because we're in a people business I say business because it is. You're in a business, you know. And you're dealing with people day in, day out in some way, shape, or form. And we all are every day outside of our business. And it's like, how are how do we deal with that? You know, is 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 it's not um uh what our predicament becomes or is. It's how we deal with it. And that's where, you know, some psychology classes could come in handy. And at the end of the day, take some law classes, at least one contract law class, because for the longest time, unless you get a gig at a college or teaching somewhere, you know, that somebody else is paying you or a orchestra. Otherwise, you're a freelance musician. Right. And at the end of the day, if you're a freelance musician, you are an entrepreneur. And if you're an entrepreneur, you're going to how do you make a living? Right. No, I think that's a really good point. I was just talking to Andrew Baldwin uh, for the podcast. He's a freelance progressionist in Chicago. And we just started talking right away about how he's writing grants. Like, and that's, yeah. a, that's like a thing that I never even, you know, thought about as a, if somebody's looking uh-huh. to be a, he, I mean, I think he was working with an orchestra, but yeah, knowing, knowing things about, you know, law or like um, grant writing or like mm-hmm. just the music business in in general, I think is is a really yeah. good really good point. Um, yeah, I mean, I, hindsight, you're right, is always twenty twenty. Like I yes. should have taken marketing classes. I should have taken business classes when I was in school, but I didn't know what I was going to be doing. No, yeah, I thought I, thought yeah. I was. I thought I was going to be playing music or w- working on excerpts for the right. rest of my life or something. But um, yeah. So. And you still could, you know, I mean, because now, mom, <laughs> oh, I don't want so to, much, I know, I know exactly. Right. But there's so much available online yeah. that man, take advantage of this stuff because there's so much available online that you can go, Hey man, I, you know, I can, I can use, I can take this class next for next to nothing. Yeah. You know, you can, you can take classes all over the place now and all kinds of things just take advantage of this world of knowledge that's out there, man. There's so yeah. much to learn about, you know, and, you know, and try to f- find out what your routine is, what works for you. Don't beat yourself up when you don't, um, maybe you don't accomplish every day what you attended intended right. to do, but you know, so you'll get it. You'll get yeah. it done. It's okay. You know, no, all, all really good things. And I, I appreciate you like sharing everything from, from like your, your, experience like getting into freelancing getting into film work um studio work you know how you built your studio sharing instruments and then just sort of the entrepreneurial aspect of your of your career so um is there anything sort of before we wrap up or before we close i mean we'll throw a lot of your of your your social deets your details or your like web web stuff like in our show notes but where is there anything you have going on you want people to know about like right Um, now yeah, well, let's see a couple things. Uh, just played on this movie Plasma, which will come out 
not until next spring, probably. Right. That's a Marvel movie. Oh, cool. Uh, let's see. Uh, there's a couple records that I played on that are up for Grammys. I'm not in the band, so I just happen to play on it. But my sure. friend Sangeeta Kaur has got a record up. Uh, that's a, uh, And then um, Jim Kimo West has got a record up for a Grammy. Um, and there's one other person. Who? <laughs> oh, Neil Lacree. Yeah, he's a he's a big uh, video game composer, or was. He's done movies. He's got broke into movies, and he's doing his own record. And then a couple other people. Wow, I forgot. Yeah. Oh, David Boswell. Yeah, yeah. Uh, has got a wonderful record out. So if okay. you, yeah, he's a jazz guitarist. Um, so check him out. He, uh, that was really a fun. Um, two other things. So my band Opium Moon. Uh, is working on a new record um, and they can see us on, you know, you can check us out online or on Spotify. We did a, we did a, uh, uh, in, in, we went to India in February and did a, a Ted talk. So that's up on. Oh yeah. You, sweet. You can go to the Ted network and find that or it's right, on right. Zoom. I mean on uh, YouTube. Um, and then I have one of the project, uh, this band called chaos, K A O S Z chaos theory. And you can see uh, or hear a lot of our stuff on Spotify. We've got a website, Chaos, Chaos Theory, and the Facebook page. I think at this point, <laughs> this sounds crazy. I think we have 400,000 followers at this point on, on Facebook. Wow. It's really weird. I don't even know how that happened because Opium Moon has a Grammy and we don't have that many <laughs> followers. So it's really weird. Um, but that band is really fun. And that uh, just, just a real quick note on that band. It's a total imp man, sorry about that, Mike. Sorry. Total improv um, band, in a, meaning we improvise from top to bottom. We don't rehearse. We don't write pieces of music. We come to wherever a studio, a gig, whatever we're doing, set up, play, and we record everything too that we do. Um, and then that comes in, then that and and those jams could be anywhere from 15 minutes to a half an hour 45 minutes long it just depends wow. on what we're feeling yeah. and then that's a gig i mean we just do this you know on these gigs right. um or a designated session we record everything and then go back after the fact and then kind of edit this stuff so the stuff that you will hear that's released has been stuff that's from a long jam that's now been edited down into something. And then there's some videos that go along with this stuff. Yeah. So that's been a fun project. And then, um, and then uh, Lucas and I and myself and a couple other people are doing some writing, our own writing projects, meditation, music, and kind of more spacey droney stuff. like Yeah. That, so. And if, again, if, if, you know, if, if anybody's got any questions that they want to ask me specifically, they can contact me directly at my email, which well, I've got a couple, but mbgordy at mac.com or mb at mbgordy.com either yeah. one and my website's www.mbgordy.com so but thank you for having me do this and no uh, it, was it was a blast a, it was a lot of fun man and um i wish you the best stay healthy and safe and and uh may all this pass sooner than later <laughs> yeah yeah man and yeah thank you i appreciate all the support and same to you and in your family and and lucas and your whole team there so yeah, keep up the good work, man. Okay, thank you so much. And I look forward to when we can um, get together in person. And I don't believe it's going to be this January. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I don't, I don't think so. No, we don't We don't have any uh, convention plans in the near future. But, yeah, yeah. Man, I look forward As, to it. Is NAM even happening this year? I don't think it's going to happen, is it? No, I think it's all virtual or online. So, yeah. yeah. It's going to be on that. Yeah, yep. so so. All right, well, listen, thank you so much, man. You take care of yourself. Yeah, thanks, MP. All right, take care, man. Bye-bye. Bye. This has been a BSP production, recorded and produced out of the Black Swamp Percussion Facilities in Zeeland, Michigan. Audio and production assistance by Nathan Coles. Intro and outro music by our friend Adam Hopper. Music sprinkled throughout the episode was composed and performed by M. B. Gordy or featured scores that highlighted his talents.